Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I was asked uh, to go ahead and give my opinion on the coronavirus, and so I waited for days. I, did, I didn't actually. I waited for longer than that. I so many people were putting so much stuff out there, and I thought, well, I'll just stay the course, do what I've been doing and leave all that to everybody else but uh, for some reason uh, there are at least a couple of you out there that think that my opinion uh, matters and so I thought that I would do that so th this will be a short video just uh, somewhat of a just my take on this uh, from a Christian perspective I've spent some time really thinking long and hard about what might be going on from a spiritual perspective. The first thing I want to say is, is that uh, I, I think a good place to begin in, in our understanding this as Christians is to understand first and foremost that it has to do with us. The, just the, the mere idea that it doesn't have anything to do with us, it's just, uh, you know, commonplace, they happen all the time, you know, it's, uh, it's happening to everybody, Christian, non-Christian alike, therefore there's nothing very uh, particular about us uh, as Christians as it relates to the coronavirus. And I, I couldn't disagree more. The question that I had to ask myself was how did Christians handle the plagues of the past? So what I did was I spent some time looking into that and trying to, to get a better uh, understanding of, of just how they did handle the plagues of the past but not just how that they handled it, what was the result that, that came about as a result of it, if there was, in fact, any result that came about as a result of it. I, I went, my mind went off all directions. I was looking at the 400 years of silence of God from Malachi to uh, the coming of Christ, where that he performed many signs and miracles. Still, Israel did not believe and then we have our Lord crucified, which begins the apostolic age where the, the, the signs and the miracles were still performed by his apostles, but yet still Israel did not believe, which I believe was the purpose for them. And so they dwindled. By the time you get to the end of Acts, they've sort of fizzled out. And now we enter into the 1900 years of what appears to be silent, the silence of God again. And, you know, there's so much I want to say about this, and I'm, I'm probably not going to do a very good job of this. But let's look at the past. Let's look at how that they handled the plagues of the past. The... The Christian response to plagues actually begins with some of our Lord's most famous teachings. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Greater love has no man than this, that uh, then he, he should lay down his life for his friends. Uh, put plainly, the Christian ethic in a time of plague considers that our own life must always be regarded as less important than that of our neighbor. In looking into this, what I discovered was that uh, during the plague periods in the Roman Empire, Christians actually made a name for themselves. The historians have, have suggested that the, the terrible plague of the second century, which, which may have killed off a quarter of, of the Roman Empire, it led to the spread of Christianity So I thought that was worthy of note, and so I wrote that down. They cared for the sick. They, 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 they actually offered a spiritual model 
uh, and they kind of put the idea out there uh, among the pagans, among the world at large in general, that plagues were not the work of an angry God, not necessarily, but the product of a broken creation that was in revolt against a loving God. But, but then I go on and I see that the more, the famous epidemic, which was a later, it was named for a bishop uh, who actually gave an account of this uh, disease in his sermons. It was probably a disease related to Ebola, uh, the plague of Cyprian. It, it helped set off the crisis of the third, the, the, uh, the third century in the Roman world. But it did something else too. It, it triggered, and here you know, to my shock, I see it triggered the explosive growth of Christianity. So maybe you see where I'm going with this. Actually, uh, Cyprian's sermons, they told Christians not to grieve for plague victims who actually are living in heaven, but to redouble efforts to care for the living. And then we, got, we go down a century later one century later, and the pagan, this, this guy, he's not a Christian, the pagan emperor uh, Julian was complaining about how the Galileans would care for even non-Christian sick people while uh, this other church historian, I can't recall his name right now, he wrote a series of articles talking about how Christians ensured that good was done to all men, not merely to the household of faith, which is exactly what Scripture tells us. And uh, there were some reports that some of the, the death rates in some of these cities the, in which there were a, a greater number of Christians were a lot, the death rates were a lot lower. So I kind of factored that into the equation and I went on looking deeper into this on how Christians have handled the plagues of the past. Which then brought me to the time of the Reformation, Martin Luther. It was the bubonic plague uh, it, it hit Wittenberg. Uh, Martin Luther refused calls to, to flee the city and protect himself. It, in, instead, he stayed and he ministered to the sick. And that refusal to flee actually cost his daughter Elizabeth her life. But it produced a tract that was called Whether Christians Should Flee the Plague. And just to quote some of what Luther said in that tract, he said, the, the plague does not dissolve our duties. It turns them to crosses on which we must be prepared to die. For Christians, it's better that we should die, he said, serving our neighbor. And so that got me to think. And you know, and all this has to be taken in, in light of the, the quarantine, the, the shutdown, the, the social distancing and all of that our medical experts today are telling us to do, which I believe in. Absolutely, I do these things myself. I wash my hands as often as I can. Uh, Never, never was there a time where I, I used uh, as much Lysol, uh, disinfectant products. We are certainly living in a very unique period of time 
in history and this, I believe, prior to the rapture. So that has to be figured in to it. What I believe also has to be figured into it as much as uh, is uh, has to do with it much ha has to do with what I've been uh, teaching verse by verse uh, in four or five epistles uh, since uh, starting this ministry after uh, well somewhere around the end of 2018 were that many of you who, who follow this ministry know that the condition or that you know the condition or the state of the so-called professing church in our modern age. Uh, what I've come to, uh, I've, I've termed uh, the uh, world religious system based on human merit. Now I'm not talking about just in the United States, but globally. And this plague is global. This, this pandemic is global. And it's particularly hitting the United States hard right now. Uh, especially New York City, uh, we've last I heard we passed Italy and China both, as far as uh, confirmed cases. So we care for each other. You know we're our brother's keeper, and and we may actually reduce the death toll by doing our part there. Now, these modern uh, scientists and medical professionals, they most likely would say that what I'm about to say uh, here at the end of the video is, well, just a bit foolish. But, and again, I'm not asking anybody to agree with me on my conclusion here as to what I believe is primarily going on, which I believe is is I don't think it's just one thing that's going on. I believe it's a series of things that's going on. I know God doesn't do things without reason, without purpose, and he could have multiple reasons for doing what he's doing right now with this pandemic. Not just one reason, but multiple. But I, I do believe there's something that rises to the top, and I'll get to that here in a moment. Uh, or I'm, I'll try to. Uh, just as a side note, I was, I was bitten by a, a copperhead uh, working around the barn the other day, and I'm fine. Everything's fine. It's, just, it's my second uh, copperhead bite, and so everything's okay. Uh, I appreciate all your prayers, uh, but I'll get through this. Uh, bit me on the left hand. Wasn't wearing gloves. Uh, kind of got a chewing out for that, but you know, sometimes I wear them and sometimes I don't. I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, or depends on how you look at it from a Christian perspective. Uh, I'm almost willing to say I was at the right place at the right time. Just depends on how you look at it. So to go on here, uh, because I, I, I'm not, it's not my intention to hold you in suspense, but uh, no, I don't believe that we should ever endanger others through our negligence or recklessness. You know, like uh, many of the kids are going on spring break and, and that sort of thing. Or uh, congregating together, having parties, you know, that sort of thing. Believers should obey the authorities. We should obey quarantine orders. We should take precautions to avoid spreading the sickness. Uh, did you know that early Christians created the first hospitals in Europe as hygienic places to provide care during times of plague? Did you know that? That is a fact worth writing down. The first sacrifice Christians need to make. Uh, I believe right, is, right now is aggressive sanitation measures and social distancing. And the coronavirus leaves over 95, last I checked, percent of its victims still breathing, okay? But it leaves, and get this, it leaves 
virtually every member of society afraid, anxious, isolated, alone. And that fact, folks, is worth noting. But then this, this caring for one another that I've just been talking about here, it only addresses the situation from mostly a physical, uh, human, natural, you know, common perspective, not a spiritual one. And it is, it is almost impossible, folks, for me to believe that we can't, that we shouldn't factor in the spiritual, okay? Not just the physical perspective. So here's what I see as it relates to that. We know God has all knowledge, all authority. We know that. He's supremely sovereign. Uh, many Christians today don't believe that, but that is a fact. And he has all knowledge, all authority over the natural and supernatural forces of this world. He knows exactly where the virus started. He knows exactly where it's going next. He's, he, he knows the outcome of this. And he has complete power to restrain it or not. He has the power to bring it back again if he wants. Christians, you and I, who trust Christ, we don't experience this as condemnation at all in any shape, form, or fashion. Romans 8.1, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. God has nothing against you, folks. Okay? He's not punishing you. If, if you're a Christian, you get the coronavirus, you get sick, and you, and, you know, you go through a terrible time of recovery, or even if you die, it's not because you sinned. And without getting into some verses that actually uh, confirm that fact, like the blind man, I'll, I'll continue on here. So it's, we don't experience this as condemnation. Pain for us folks, all right, any kind of pain, I don't care what it is, any kind of suffering, any kind of pain, for us, it is, it is purifying, not punitive. Now, I will admit, sometimes sickness is, uh, is other than God's mercy. I mean, you know, that's why there's different, that's what, that's what makes this compl a little bit complicated, because there's different avenues to this. Sometimes sickness is God's mercy. I mean, some Christians can die of illnesses so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Uh, a good example would be 1 Corinthians, the Lord's Supper. He brings them to heaven, saving them from sin. Not to punish them, but to save them. But sickness can also come as judgment. I'm not talking about believers. I'm talking about the world. God sometimes uses disease to bring particular judgments upon those who reject Him. Just read Acts chapter 12. King Herod, he exalts himself uh, in being called a God, and immediately an angel of the Lord strikes him down because he didn't give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms, and he breathed his last. But I believe that we can see from Scripture that all natural disasters are a call to God's people everywhere. And I'm talking about God's people. Listen to my words carefully here, folks. We can see from Scripture that all natural disasters, no matter how small, no, no matter how great, are a call to God's people everywhere to repent and realign their lives by grace with the truth of God's Word. That's probably the most important thing, I, at least in my opinion, I've said all the way through this. It's not as much a, a call to those who are His to be redeemed, folks, because they will be. Okay? And I, I don't, I'm not entirely ruling that out. I'm just saying that 
you know, they will be redeemed. All of his people will be. Regardless, plague or no plague. What I'm saying is, I believe it's a call to those who are his to be saved, delivered, okay? Delivered. I've pointed this out in the past, I don't know how many times, the difference between redemption and salvation, saved is not redeemed. We are redeemed to be saved. And many believers today are redeemed and never, ever will be saved. Okay? In, in, the, in, the, in the sense of, of how the, the word salvation is used as in deliverance from sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and death. Okay? We, we, we look ahead to Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, if any man's work is burned up, that's his entire life's work, singular, is burned up, yet he himself shall be saved, yet so is through fire. Their entire life's work amounts to hay, wood, and stubble instead of gold, silver, precious stone. Therefore, therefore, I have every right to say, as Scripture says, that many who are redeemed will never be saved. And I'm not even going to bring that down to the word some. Many. Because the world religious system based on human merit as a whole today is living according to the law, walking according to the flesh. They are not being saved or delivered in the progressive sense. This is the age that we're living in. We're bordering on, if not living in, the age of apostasy. Right now, I believe we were, personally, we were born into it. That's where we stand in history right now, prior to His coming, okay? Which I believe, as many do, is near. So, delivered, saved. I believe that is the message of Jesus to the world at this moment in history under the coronavirus, a message to His people, okay? prior to His return for His church, saying, repent. I mean, just what will it take to get you, my people, to trust Me? And I, I base this assumption, if you want to call it that, I, I believe that's pretty much what it is. This is just my take. My, this is my two cents worth here. I base that on the logical fact that at the time in which this virus, uh, this pandemic arrived, trusting Christ, and I've often said that's what He desires most of us, is that we trust Him. Though He slay me, yet will I trust in Him. That, 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 that was and is the greatest lack among those who are called by His name. Folks, I wish I could really better state this. Who, who of you out there honestly believes that when we're living in an, in, an, in an age in which, for the most part, Christians themselves have taken a departure from sound doctrine, that... Christianity today, for the most part, is, is made up, it, it's comprised of a system in which it, it tries to, to seek to earn merit and favor with God by what it does or doesn't do. It's, it's totally abandoned the doctrine of grace, folks. I'll, 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 I'll have, I got to say it again. If you followed this channel, you know what I'm talking about. If you're new and you just stumbled on this video, you don't have a clue as to what I'm talking about. Because you, you may very well likely be a part of that system, that religious system based on human merit. 
I believe he's about to come. He's about to return. That there's more to this this plague than just you know maybe punishing the wicked or or you know uh, bringing some some Christians home. Uh, I, there's I have I have to see. I, I I don't know how to explain this. I guess I'm not doing a very good job of looking at what is so wrong today in the church. And then when I see the coronavirus step in alongside it, it's impossible, folks, for me to not see that the two have, have something to do with each other. Are you following what I'm, what I'm saying here? Now, I could be wrong. I'm not saying that this is, this is correct. I'm just saying this is, this is how my spirit perceives what's going on here. Our own life must always be regarded as less important than that of our neighbor spiritually. Plagues were not the, the work of an angry God, remember? Okay, Martin Luther. But the product of a broken creation and revolt against the loving God. But what of a broken new creation in revolt against the loving God? What about that? Plagues of the past triggered the explosive growth of Christianity. That's a fact. It's a, it's a historical fact. And, and we know that God is concerned as much about the growth of those who are already His people. In past plagues, Christian, uh, or in past plagues, death rates in cities with, with Christian communities might have just been half that of other cities. But what about death from the standpoint of death to sin, self, law, and the need to grow spiritually? Is this a wake-up call to the church prior to His return, giving us every opportunity to repent, to turn back to God, to, to, uh, to come out away from separate ourselves from that religious system that's based on human merit. By the time we get to the end of Acts and reading through Acts, what we see is, is that these sign gifts, miracles, uh, faith, faith healings, tongues, it all ceased. Why? Why? Because Israel was not convinced that Jesus was their Messiah. And so we entered into the last 1900 years of what I believe is of human history. You know, as in the past, the plague didn't, didn't dissolve uh, people of their duties. It, it, it turned them to crosses on which they had to be prepared to die. Well, spiritually, we die to self. We die to self in order that others may live. Paul said, I die daily. Constantly, folks, we're constantly being delivered over to death. Okay? It's, you know, life springs forth out of death, death to self, in order that others may live. Just as in the physical sense, spiritually, we need to assume a burden of care. In the same sense that we physically must never endanger others through our, neglig our negligence, our recklessness, you know, when it comes to like social distancing and personal hygiene, and, you know, we shouldn't ever endanger others through our own neg negligence. I have a little trouble pronouncing that word. But, but ought to be taking precautions to avoid spreading the sickness so too, in the spiritual sense, we should never endanger others through our negligence or our recklessness with God's Word, but we ought to take precautions to avoid spreading the sickness, quote-unquote, of doctrinal error. Distancing ourselves socially, or I should, or I should say spiritually, 
from the disease of doctrinal error that infects the body of Christ. Are you hearing me? Because doctrinal error, just like the virus, leaves Christians, God's people, 95% of its victims, still breathing, but it leaves virtually every member of his body afraid, anxious, isolated, and alone. And that's about the gist of it. You wanted my opinion? There it is. Take it for what it's worth. We tend to look at this only in the physical sense. Or it's, it's tempting to look at it, oh, God's just judging the world. You know, I don't know why Christians want to leave the church out of it. Well, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with us because we're the church. Are you kidding me, folks? Are you? As the physical, you know, we tend to look at this only in the physical sense, but the physical always, always reflects the spiritual. Always. We saw this in Colossians. Lie not one to another. Well, okay, so what? what is that saying? Is that saying that don't don't tell me you're going to the store when you're not, or is that or is that saying something a little deeper than that, or is you know don't lie to me doctrinally. Doctrinal error. Well, I, personally, I think it's both, but what is far greater? What's far greater? Okay, you lying to me, telling me that you went to the store when you didn't, or you lying to me, telling me that. Uh, Grace is not enough to save me. You know, my works is, in the end, ultimately, it's my works that saves me. What's worse? So we tend to only look at this in the physical sense. But the physical always reflects the spiritual. You know, just like with fornication, there is also spiritual fornication. So just as with this virus that infects the body, there's also doctrinal error that infects the body of Christ, folks. And I believe it is. I believe it's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call to every one of us who name the name of Jesus Christ. We're rushing around searching for a vaccine. Well, and I hope we find it. I hope they find it. But we know that in the spiritual sense, Christ is the vaccine. He is the cure for all spiritual illness. Until next time, I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.